Ladies and gentlemen, it is um, my great pleasure and privilege to uh, welcome you to, uh, to CPOS. My name is uh, Martin Oorb, I'm uh, president of CPOS. And um, it is a special honor to uh, welcome Tom. Thank you very much for flying all the way to Copenhagen. And as you can see, it's appreciated. We filled the room. I think there's about 100 people here, something like that. Um, it is um, not every day that we have uh, someone like Tom in this, uh, in this room. Um, and it, it really is a, a great honor. Tom Palmer is a, um, a person who specialized in uh, traveling around the world and uh, attempting to eradicate coercion and increase liberty for, for people around the world. Uh, Tom is uh, vice president at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, uh, where he's in charge of Atlas's uh, international program. Um, he's also general director of Atlas's Global Initiative for Free Trade, Peace and Prosperity. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a director of Cato University. And uh, yesterday Tom was teaching, by the way, at, uh, at CPOS University uh, to our lecture. Uh, special privilege for our CPOS University students. Um, Tom holds several academic degrees, one of them being a doctorate in politics from Oxford University and has uh, published articles in scholarly journals, uh, a number of them. Um, unfortunately, and this is a practical note that I have, Tom has asked me to, uh, to, to give you, Tom has contracted a um, respiratory lung infection. A lung infection. Um, so, uh, you know, bear over with his, his voice and uh, yesterday I witnessed a couple of times uh, coughing fits that looked quite nasty. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, as, as I understand, sometimes he has um, the coughing fit with trouble, with breathing at the same time. And if that happens during the lecture, it looks nasty, but it, it, it's mm. not going to kill him, okay? <laughs> and first of all, I've been told that it's no longer infectious. <laughs> okay. Um, but having said that, it's, it's a really uh, unpleasant thing he's got. And thank you very much, Tom, for still holding the lecture. Tom will speak for about uh, 50 minutes. And then we'll open up for questions. And after that, there'll be an opportunity to buy uh, Tom's recent book, uh, Realizing Freedom, which I highly recommend. It is available for the ridiculously low price of 150 krona. Uh, and you can get the author to sign it. So there. Thanks, Tom. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I should say that sometimes I stop breathing, which is very unpleasant. If it lasts longer than five minutes, <laughs> do something. <laughs> but normally, I can start again after a minute or so. <clears throat> well, it's really an honor when Martin uh, contacted me to uh, come and address CPOS. Uh, I think it's one of the most effective think tanks in the world for the advancement of liberty. So it's really a special honor uh, to be here, and in particular because when I am in other countries, the Philippines or Japan, or Morocco, or Russia, or Azerbaijan, talking to people who are considering similar activities, I point to CPOS as a model of what can be done by a group of focused, intelligent, and dedicated people. So I'm a big admirer of the work of CPOS. And I've always admired it from afar, and now I get to come here and uh, be among you. My remarks will be divided into four parts. First, I want to talk a little bit about my involvement in the communist world, and thankfully now formerly communist or reforming post-communist countries. Second, I want to describe some of the work that my colleagues and I are carrying out in the Middle East. 
and also in the wider Islamic world. Many people make a mistake that's very significant of confusing Arabs and Muslims. Arab is an ethnicity, referring to speakers of a language. Islam is a religion. There are more Muslims in Indonesia than there are in the Arab world. Not all Arabs are Muslim, and most Muslims are not Arab. So that's an important distinction to keep in mind. A third, I want to talk about some of the success stories in overcoming the legacy of communism and what we've learned in practice about what works and what doesn't work, and some of the failed cases and some of the successes. Fourth, I want to talk about a struggle that is going on right now, a tremendous civil war, if you will, within the Islamic world. And it's very important to stress that contrary to the clash of civilizations discussion, this is not primarily a conflict of the Islamic world with Europe or other civilizations. It is a conflict within the Islamic world. And how we, whether Muslims or Christians or Jews or Hindus or non-believers, Scientologists, whatever, can interact in a positive way with our tolerant, liberal-minded Muslim friends who are the primary victims in this struggle. It's very important to stress that, that they are the ones victimized the most. So let me start with a little bit about why I was interested in this kind of work. Uh, first, I think as a person, I'm a highly uh, non-risk averse person. Uh, I don't get scared about going to certain places and I realized at a certain point in my life, I'm not afraid of other people. And I don't want to go through life being afraid of other people. I'm not particularly foolish in that way. I don't welcome being killed, but I'm just not afraid of them. And I learned a lot in the Soviet Union and elsewhere that uh, like with animals, if you show fear, you're doomed. And it's very important not to show fear. So I had been involved uh, promoting liberty and limited government, personal responsibility, all of those old-fashioned virtues in the United States since the early 1970s. I worked as a student activist, worked on political campaigns. I was a lobbyist for the National Taxpayers Union. You could imagine what a fun job that was uh, to be the only person testifying in front of Congress. Seven representatives of seven groups who were going to get the taxpayers' money and me on the panel. Uh, for the Committee Against Registration the Draft, I lobbied in favor of free trade and against uh, foolish and self-destructive trade restrictions and so on. And I pursued my academic career in the interstices. So it took me nine years to get my undergraduate degree. I was considered uh, for tenure as a student at my college. Uh, because I would work for a couple of years, save money, and go back for another year, study, and then go do something else and work for liberty and save all my money and go back. And then went on and did a master's degree in philosophy while working as a lobbyist, editor, journalist, and so on, and later on to Oxford. In the 1980s, I started to work more closely with European liberals. I was working at this time for the Institute for Humane Studies based at George Mason University. Some of you may know this organization. It's a really outstanding group. Uh, they even allow Danish students to take part in their programs. It's really quite broad-minded <laughs> organization. Uh, and so any students or anyone who knows students, I highly recommend checking out their programs. And we established the IHS, Institute for Humane Studies Europe, based in France with a group of French free market economists and law professors. And it's still 
continues as now Institute for Economic Studies Europe, and they do seminars uh, around Europe in English and in French for the two primary monolingual groups in Europe. In the uh, 1980s, I started to have a feeling that communism was over. And I think maybe a little bit more presciently than some others. Henry Kissinger and others thought that this Soviet bloc would be with us forever. And even some people thought it was destined eventually to wear us down and win. And others thought it was unlikely to survive. And I was in that latter group and was worried, A, how can we help it to collapse faster, but also to collapse in a way that produces something better. Because we should remember, as terrible as that regime was, you can do worse. And some of the former republics of the Soviet Union have discovered that. Think about Uzbekistan, where opponents of the president Islam Karimov are cooked alive in oil, something so grotesque that uh, the later communists could not have imagined such cruelty, or Tajikistan, where over 100,000 people were killed in the civil war that followed the end of the Soviet Union. And it seemed important to introduce people to an alternative, which is the ideas of liberty, of the rule of law, of the market economy, property rights, peace, toleration, democratic accountability, and so on. And so I began contacting people and trying really to track down friends, people with whom we could work. We knew they had to exist back there. And I should point out, not all anti-communists are friends of liberty. There were still revanchist, fascist groups, and nationalists as well. We wanted to find those people who believed in liberty. I moved to Austria, <coughs> and which was a very convenient country, being neutral at the time and well positioned. Uh, the train station had nice direct trains to Budapest and so on, and trying to track people down who could be allies and so I had a number of interesting uh, experiences, going places, getting invitations, official invitations, issued normally by utter idiots, mainly American groups that love to do conferences in this region about how much we could learn from communism. And I had to bear this uh, horrifying experience of authentically stupid Americans saying, well, you have much to learn to, from us, but of course we have so much to learn from you, which of course was rubbish. Um, but it got me invitations on the official stationery of the Academy of Sciences, or whatever country it was, with a stamp. And I learned to hoard these because these are extremely valuable instruments. When I would be arrested for having uh, illegal books, I would say, I have an official invitation from Comrade Burzek, the head of the Academy of Sciences of the Czech and Slovak Federal Socialist Republic, and I think he will be very disappointed if I am delayed, <laughs> and so on. Or when I had several photocopying machines that I took to Moscow for friends, and they said, why do you have two photocopying machines? I said, I always travel with two photocopying <laughs> machines. I'm giving lectures at the Moscow State University. I have an official invitation from the rector of the university and from the Academy of Sciences of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And I think they'll be very disappointed <laughs> if I'm delayed. And if you're just tough with them, they, the guy is thinking, I don't want to end up on the Tajik-Afghan border. <laughs> this guy might have some friends. They finally say, just go. And so uh, that was something that I learned in that context. So I took books, uh, photocopiers, fax machines, even paper, which was illegal. It's hard to imagine. It was illegal to own paper. Paper was counted. You would be issued so many sheets, and it was controlled. So bringing 5,000 sheets of paper, which, trust me, is a staggeringly heavy luggage, 
you have to make it look light, uh, was uh, a gift to our friends. I arranged the publication of translation and publication of books by Ludwig von Mises, one of the greatest Ukrainian economists of the 20th century. He was born in Lemberg, which is now Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, F.A. Hayek, Ronald Coase, Milton Friedman, and other great liberal thinkers. And the first non-Marxist textbooks uh, in these countries since the communists took over in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Russia, Romania, Albania, Bulgaria. My favorite textbook, The Economic Way of Thinking by Paul Hain. It's a wonderful introductory textbook to the study of economics and it really was uh, wonderful for people to get these. Uh, and I have to say it really touches my heart when I meet some 20-year-old Romanian student and she says oh that book that was the one it was my professor introduced me and that professor was someone I met when he or she was 20 years old and I gave them the book so it's, it really warms my heart to find that experience. I helped to set up the first Cato Institute conference in the Soviet Union in Moscow and I can tell you I uh, had a little bit of fun because the conference center for this uh, big event we had the mayor of Moscow come and a police um, care of well, no, what's the word of uh, 12 cars with the lights going to deliver apples <laughs> to the conference so we get a sense of how horrible the situation was and I delighted for the Europeans who came to the conference to participate or speak, we had some North Americans and European speakers, I would say, how old do you think this building is? Everything was broken. When you put your hand on the railing, it just fell off. The stairs were all crumbly at the edge. Nothing worked. And they would say, maybe, I don't know, 45, 50 years old, say it was completed six months ago <laughs> and this is the first event held in this building to give you a sense the communists were so gracious they made things pre-broken <laughs> for you um, essentially nothing functioned um, we established later some permanent programs at the Cato Institute in the Russian language which we now transferred over to Atlas in liberty.ru so anyone who reads Russian we have quite an active program uh, there and I continue working throughout the region with all the what we call intellectual entrepreneurs people who understand the ideas and principles of liberty and limited government and free markets and have the energy and the ability to do something about it so we have kind of a wide definition. CPOS is a great example of that. Smart people understand things with energy and ability. Real entrepreneurs. And in addition, I've done a lot of work in the last 10 years, well, 14 years, in China, where we face rather different circumstances, a different evolutionary path than the former Soviet Union. And we worked there with very smart, very brave, very determined Chinese friends of liberty. I'd like to tell you one quick story about a man I admire tremendously. His name is Mao Yuxi. He's 86 and a founder of the Unirule Institute. So think tank, a kind of sister to CPOS in Beijing. And Unirule is their translation into English of the Chinese term for rule of law. Which they didn't think, but they said, how do we translate this? So they said, Unirule, one rule. And it's a nice explication into somewhat broken English. But explains their idea that it's the rule of law institute. And Mao Yuxi has a dignity that is very difficult to describe, but I think Scandinavian people understand because Scandinavian people I always consider very dignified people, and he has that character about him. He suffered terribly under the communists. He was imprisoned, 
He was tortured. He came within hours of dying during the great leap forward of starvation when over 30 million Chinese people were starved to death by the insane policies and collectivization of their government. On December 25th of last year, you know what day that is, so that's Latin Christmas Day, the Chinese authorities sentenced uh, Lu Xiaobo to 11 years in prison. Lu Xiaobo is a great man. Uh, he has been in prison many times and he is unafraid. He was not afraid of them. He married his wife. They have almost never lived together because he has been in prison almost all of this time. Uh, he comes out for a short time and they send him back. They gave him 11 years for being the primary author of the Charter 2008, which is a, a call, not really radical or extreme, but a call for freedom of speech, free press, rule of law, accountability and removal of the monopoly of the Communist Party in China, which is, of course, the big question. And Mao Yuxi published a manifesto saying, I share co-responsibility with Liu Xiaobo. In other words, come arrest me. And he said, if I die in prison, it's just one more service to my country and the freedom of the Chinese people. He said, what can they do to me? I'm an old man. He said, it would be fine to die in their prison and to set a standard for how Chinese people behave when confronted with tyranny. So it's really an honor to work with such people. Next, let me discuss a little bit about Middle East, Arab countries, and then the broader Muslim world. Obviously, the 9-11 catastrophe was a real wake-up call. Something was seriously wrong. And I had worked with Arab friends and colleagues, but had not occurred to me to be as active as we had been in the communist world. At that time, I was working at the Cato Institute, and we began a very extensive program of outreach in the region, searching again for Arab liberals, using the term that would be used in that part of the world, or moderates is another term that's often coextensive with what most Europeans would call a liberal. Made a number of visits, visiting universities, looking for the right people. I was in Iraq on five occasions after the invasion, which I opposed. I thought it was a colossal mistake. Of course, I was wrong. It turned out to be a fabulously successful <laughs> model of social transformation. But nonetheless, uh, an opportunity to try to meet the people who were standing up at, in that circumstance for something other than tyranny. And we eventually established a program, uh, Minbar al Hurriya. Dot org, which means the forum, this is a forum, of liberty. And the model that we've used for this and the other 13 programs we've established like it, I um, got essentially from Jeff Bezos, a Cuban refugee to the United States who established Amazon.com, and from a Norwegian businessman who told me, he said, Tom, Branding is almost everything when you're marketing. And your marketing ideas, Olaf Nilsunde, with color line shipping, and he said, your marketing ideas, brand them. And I took this very seriously. I realized business people actually make stuff. They make basically everything. And they must know something about how the world works. I'm not a businessman. Uh, I'm a, a professional egghead, you might say. Uh, but I respect business people. I was once at a dinner in Washington, D.C. We went around 
and realized there was only one person at the table who was in business. And we thanked him for producing all the wealth we were about to consume. I got honorary mention because I defend free enterprise. So I so said I get like 0.7 <laughs> on the scale. I don't actually produce any wealth, but I defend those who do produce wealth. Uh, but I figured these people are smart, and I got a lot of books on branding and marketing. And I said Amazon.com was not Amazon Books. It's Amazon.com. Jeff Bezos insisted that dot and com was in it. If you know the name, you know how to find them. It's also not a website. It's a platform for marketing products. I took that thought about that. It's not the Amazon website where people put on post videos or pictures of themselves doing embarrassing things. It's a platform for marketing their products. And that's the model that we established for that. So we have also platforms in Persian and Kurdish and Azerbaijani and Portuguese and Bahasa and many other languages. <coughs> As such, every product is branded with that. And I'm very rough with my colleagues. I said, I want the brand on the book, the video, the summer school, the sky riding with the airplane, everything. I want the brand on it. Because even if I don't buy the book in the store, I might remember the brand and go look at it. In Arabic, we publish over 1,500 articles per year in the Arabic print media that we syndicate. We have a professional staff, very, very good people who take articles either written by Arabs. We have 48 writers who write for us regularly or translated into Arabic from other languages. And they then edit them, make them elegant, beautiful, poetic Arabic and send them to the newspapers. And the newspapers are asked to do one thing. It's free of charge. But they must say syndicated by minbaralhuria.org, which means if I read it in the paper, I might say that's interesting and go find it on the internet and then find all the other online books and seminars and programs. We have published a lot of books in this program, books by Mises and Hayek, The Road to Serfdom, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, Textbooks, a major book that took us two years to produce on Islam and modernity, in which we took articles written in Arabic on the tradition of freedom within the Islamic tradition, and also translated by Turkish liberals and Indonesian and Malaysian liberals. And you can imagine how difficult this was to translate these different articles into Arabic, but it's been quite uh, popular. We do summer schools. We just had one in Morocco in Arabic policy forums, videos. We have another summer school shortly in Lebanon. We use Facebook, and I just got a grant from an internet entrepreneur to begin systematically using Arabic Facebook and Persian Facebook to reach out to young people. You can target advertising for people who list their age, their ideology, their religion, so if I list what describe myself as moderate or tolerant or liberal or open minded, my ad will appear on that page and only on those pages, not the ones that say I am an insane Islamist <laughs> crazy person. Uh, because we want to find these people and let them know they are not alone and that there is a intellectual narrative. We've expanded this extensively. We work a lot in Malaysia and Indonesia. We have a program called Akademi Merdeka.org, the Freedom Academy, and we do programs in English and in Bahasa, which is spoken by 220 million people, slightly more than Danish. <laughs> uh, we also have started programs in Hindi and Urdu, Azadi.me and Humazad.org for uh, India, and um, India, by the way, is one of the most, one of the largest Muslim countries in the world, over 150 
Muslim population in that country and well worth interacting with. What we want to do is to create an alternative narrative because you cannot defeat an idea with a bullet. This is what the United States is starting to realize. You can only defeat it with another idea and not with nothing but another alternate explanation of the world that makes more sense. That's how you defeat a bad idea. It's with a better idea. As an example, a friend of mine, Dr. Shafiq Gabra, is the former president of American University of Kuwait, very outspoken and brave critic of both Arab nationalists, Arab socialism, Arab dictatorship, and the intolerant Islamists. He came to the United States as a young man to do a doctorate in political science so he could explain, according to all of the crazy leftist theories at the time, how Western capitalism marginalized and exploited the rest of the world. He was an Arab nationalist, a socialist, and so on. And he had the unpleasant experience, as he said, very unpleasant, of coming face to face with the theory of public choice in economics. Much as Friedrich Hayek, as a young man, had the distinctly unpleasant experience when he was a young socialist of meeting Ludwig von Mises and realizing Mises' arguments against socialism were unanswerable was a better account. And it's, we might think, oh, how liberating. In fact, this is painful and unpleasant to realize all the things you believe were rubbish, they were silly or absurd. And Shafiq had that experience. He said, this economics, this public choice economics, it makes sense of the world. I can explain the world with it. These other theories don't. We can't explain why Arab countries are impoverished despite the oil and so on of the Saudi Peninsula. What he found was an alternate narrative that made more sense, was coherent, accorded with measurable reality. And that's the kind of experience we want more and more people to have. This is the way to defeat bad ideas. Another uh, good friend, Mustafa Akyol, from Turkey. He's a newspaper columnist. A brave person. He defends apostasy, that is to say, leaving religions, in particular leaving Islam. He doesn't defend it. Let me be more careful. He does not defend apostasy. He condemns it. He's a Muslim. He defends the right to apostasy. He said apostasy is a human right to freedom of religion. And he will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the intolerance. And I saw him, our colleagues in Malaysia had him at an Akademi Merdeka program I also taught at. And he debated this issue publicly and won. And I was really impressed to see that. Against Islamists who finally said, I don't have an answer to that. And the reason was he knew not only the logic and so on, but also Islamic history. He's a, a scholar. And he said, your interpretation is challengeable. I don't think it's correct, and here's why. It's not a requirement of Islam. This person is a good friend of ours and the kind of person we should ally with and be sure to assist. Third part. I'd like to talk about some success stories in the transformation of communist states to a wide variety of alternatives, some of which we could identify as liberal and some definitely not. The first thing that uh, we learned very quickly on was the importance of a legal tradition, a tradition of law and property. In Eastern European countries, and we sh uh, now people understand Czechoslovakia is not, and Czech Republic is not Eastern European. They always bristled when they were called that, Central European. But in the uh, 
countries that had a shorter experience of the communist nightmare, it was typically easier to move because they had a tradition of law on which they could draw. Tradition of Roman law, people who still remembered these things and in some cases taught them in universities. Even in a country like Albania, different villages transitioned more easily than others. And when I was in Albania, uh, when it was collapsing, which was also quite an experience, I've never thrown up every night from the food. It was actually slippery from bacteria and they were so poor. It was really a terrible place. Uh, I will tell you one anecdote. Uh, when I flew to uh, Tirana from Budapest on Malev, it was full of quite sort of brutal characters who were the initial traders. They, they didn't dress like Danish businessmen. These were high-risk persons who were bringing back goods from Budapest and they're just sticking them over in the overhead bins, including staggering amounts of vodka, <laughs> which you don't really want over you as you fly. And the gentleman next to me was the brand new um, Soviet uh, protocol officer for their embassy. And he spoke elegant Albanian. Mine was not bad at the time, but his was better. And as well as English and German and Russian, naturally. And he asked me a question as we were flying, being a diplomat and a protocol officer, very diplomatic. He said, so this is your first time to Tirana? I said, yes. He said, hmm. Have you ever been to Moscow? I said, yes, many, many times. He said, oh. Well, Tirana will not be a complete surprise then, because he recognized <laughs> Moscow was a dump. And he said, um, would you be offended if I made some recommendations? And I said, no, please. He said, well, the first thing is take all of your meals in the Hotel Daiti which was the hard currency hotel for foreigners. They only took Italian or German money. And I said, okay, why? He said, I cannot recommend the kitchen very highly, except on usual occasions you can keep it down. <laughs> so I remember that I took only two meals there and could not for the rest, and I experienced what he described. He also gave me his business card. He said, if you have any difficulties, do come and visit me at the Soviet Embassy. The Americans are useless, but I would be more helpful to you. So I remembered that also. He was exactly right about that as well. Uh, but in Albania, old villages that had been traditional and established found it fairly easy to transition back to private property. The villagers knew this belonged to your grandparents and this is your grandparents and they sorted things out quite efficiently. They also went and divided all of the communal property even down to the nails extracted from the buildings. It's really quite astonishing to see people dismantle the Communist Party headquarters down to the nails. And they said, you get 17 nails <laughs> from the headquarters of the Communist Party. But the new villages established by the communist authorities on the basis of ex internal exile or slave labor were a catastrophe. They had no previous history or what we call shelling points in game theory, prominent points around which people can uh, cooperate. Uh, in, there have been greater struggles in the Balkans and the Black Sea region, which did not have such long experience of property. They had emerged from Turkish domination into a variety of different kinds of dictatorships. Uh, and it's been uh, quite difficult there. And even as you move more towards Central Asia, where there's been almost no history of these principles, it's very difficult to establish them. Kyrgyzstan is an interesting counterexample to the region where they have been attempting, and there are a lot of classical liberals including a good friend of mine, Emil Umataliev, who's the Minister of Economic Development now in a, in a government that is less corrupt than the previous one. Uh, and he, but he's actually quite an honest, trustworthy person. We'll see how they do. 
But let me tell you a very interesting story of a catastrophe that turned around, and that's Georgia. And it's an example of how a small group of people can have a big impact if they're very focused on what they do. In 2003, Georgia was an authentically failed state. It was a disaster. Agriculture had been reduced to virtually subsistence level. They had gone from over 1 million hectoliters per year of wine production to 25,000. Imagine the decline. Real agriculture was subsistence. People grew and ate. There was almost no agricultural market. Electricity in Belize, the capital city, an hour a day. Imagine again, this is in the capital. Staggering corruption, uh, banditry, impossible to travel across the country without being repeatedly held up by either freelance bandits or the traffic police, who were also bandits. You carried two wallets, the bribe wallet and the real wallet. And the bribe wallet had to have just enough not to be beaten. To cal calculate it, imagine on the margin, working out these calculations. When Saakashvili uh, came to power in a real revolt among the villages, not the urban elite, interesting change from the model we normally expect, that the people, and sophisticated intellectuals in the center. This was the opposite. He was no classical liberal and still is not. He's a Kemalist. He admires Mustafa Kemal Ataturk from Georgia. Build a strong Georgian nation. But he came into contact with Kahe Bendukidza, a businessman in Russia, very involved with the Union of Industrialists, very strong, outspoken, laissez-faire, free market advocate. He was a biologist and a very, very smart businessman, as he calls himself a, a mini oligarch. Not that rich, but pretty rich in shipbuilding and uh, industrial machinery and other things, taking over state firms that were producing negative value, reorganizing them and, and making stuff people wanted to buy. He said, I can help you to build this as a great nation, but you cannot do it through statism and socialism. You need a free market and a productive economy. And he convinced Saakashvili and his assistants, okay, we'll try this idea. <laughs> and what he did, though, was very smart. He said, it's impossible to start a business in this country. It's just impossible. So, gather all the papers. How many licenses are needed? 909. They had cabinet meetings where they held it up and said, okay, do we need this? Let's read it. What is it? Do we need it? Anyone? No. Get rid of it. Put it on the list for parliament to abolish. They went from 909 to 159 and later 137. Most are building permits, so you can see some externality-based reason will the building fall on you or has a good foundation, but not permits to enter business, to offer goods and services. They cut the state budget quite dramatically. They eliminated state employment by 50%. It's a rather nice number. <laughs> They fired all the traffic police. They said, enough, these are bandits. And for two months, there were no traffic police, during which time traffic accidents went down. <laughs> Tells you. And as Kaka pointed out, when he would eliminate agency after agency after ministry, people said, oh my God, how can you eliminate the Ministry of Health? He said, because they don't produce any health. That's why. And his way of putting it, he said, look, if you're in a dark room and you turn off the light, it does not get any darker, does it? <laughs> it was a very clear way of explaining it. He said, we just eliminate people that aren't making any light. So we're not losing anything. They then rehired a smaller traffic police group trained by British and uh, Los Angeles policemen. Not always the least brutal in the world, but less brutal than <laughs> Soviet policemen. Uh, gave them new uniforms, higher pay, much smaller force, and, and new cars, and set a different expectation of the population. These are not the same. And if you had been a former traffic policeman, don't bother applying 
for the job. So the expectations of the citizens were set up to be different. And they put signs, if you are asked for money by a traffic policeman, call this number, it will not be answered by a traffic policeman. <laughs> it's very, also very important. Now, I would not have any fear to be stopped by a Georgian traffic policeman, even less than an Italian traffic policeman <laughs> or a Los Angeles traffic policeman. They're quite honest. If they pull you over, you were speeding. Um, it's changed completely. You can drive any place in the country outside of the Russian occupied regions and have no problem. They eliminated visas for almost all countries. They said, why do we have visas? What's the point? If an Italian businessman wants to do business, why should he go to the Georgian embassy and wait three weeks? He should go to the airport, fly here, do business, and fly home to his mistress. Um, why make them get a visa? They reduced tariffs to zero on almost all categories of goods. A few exceptions that were politically powerful, which you will understand, agricultural lobby. Uh, that, that's a problem there also. But almost everything else, zero. And they outsourced regulation. They said, why do we have a ministry of inspecting things? If, they said, if it can be sold in Denmark, if it's good enough for even Danish people, it's good enough for Georgians. So all you have to show is this is certified safe for European Union, South Korea, Japan, U.S., Canada, etc. So it eliminated these huge regulatory obstacles. It's been an enormous success story. Even during the war with Russia, the economy continued to grow at a diminished rate, but still positive. Had it been under the old principles of the old state-dominated system, there would have been a complete collapse. And yet the economy continued to buzz. Last, let me conclude with some comments on the Muslim world. There are two core uh, principles that I think need to be kept in mind. First, there is a problem, and we do need to address it. If decent people don't talk about these things, brutal, intolerant, hateful people will. And I think this is an important principle that when other people look the other way, don't want to talk about honor killings and so on, then what is going to happen is the intolerant, nativist, extremist, nationalist will talk about these things and will dominate the agenda. So decent, civilized people need to address these questions. But the second point is, the best friends in the fight against this are quite frankly not Christians or Jews or Hindus, they're Muslims. These are your best friends if you want to live in a peaceful society. Let me quote a man who set the pattern. In August of 1790, George Washington, who had been congratulated by the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, they said, congratulations on being president. It's really great to live in this country. Please do not launch a pogrom. But they said this in some more, you know, more subtle terms. And he wrote back a lovely, actually very beautiful letter I would like to read at some length. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. I think that sets a, the standard. Not toleration like we tolerate you in your little ghetto, but real freedom and equality under the law. We've seen this in the debate in New York over the Cordoba House, Imam Raouf Faisal, whom I 
have met on a number of occasions, has the right to build the Cordoba house. He bought the land legitimately. It belongs to his organization. They didn't steal it. It is in violation of no zoning laws or other restrictions. It isn't even on ground zero. This is a grotesque provocation. It's some blocks away across from a striptease establishment. <laughs> it's a provocation. And Newt Gingrich recently wrote a piece that was shameful, saying, well, he went through all the ways that they could block them from building this, each one of which was a violation of the rule of law. And I think he should be ashamed of himself for taking that stand. We will twist the law until we get our way and refuse to allow them to build this. I believe that there should be a hand of friendship reached out to those who wish to live peacefully with us. And I find many times people who express very bigoted views, I say, do you know any Muslims? Have you ever talked to someone and welcomed someone to your neighborhood? You will find the vast majority of them are the people down the street. It's the Pakistani uh, doctor and family <coughs> who want to live here peacefully. And they are your potential friends and neighbors. But that said, I believe there should be no toleration for those who encourage and incite violence. The British government for much too long tolerated the incitement to murder in London, in mosques, when other Muslims had gone to the authorities and complained and said, this is contrary to British law, to stand up and say, you should kill the Jews, that you should kill people who sell alcohol. If you find a Muslim drinking a beer, kill him, and so on. And finally, Abu Hamza al-Masri, that malicious, horrible man, the one they call the, the one with the hook, we've seen in the news, uh, after years of openly preaching murder and assassination and hiding behind the presumption of innocence and the rule of law, they finally said, we would not tolerate this of another British subject, we will not tolerate it of you. And that was correct. But we have the case of Mullah Krekar in Norway, also a man who's open advocate and open practitioner of murder. He has killed people in his native country and was given asylum as a political refugee, despite the well-established fact he is a killer. And I think that the Norwegian authorities have been foolish and short-sighted in not taking action against such people when he's very open in inciting murder against his hosts. Perhaps even worse, we have European and American uh, multiculti, as they say in German, the multiculti cultists, who excuse honor killings. I'd like to read to you a couple of quotations uh, from something called the Next Generation Network. You can get the general sense. <laughs> we deplore the monocultural view which is proposed as a supposed alternative to violence. Monocultural means nonviolent culture. Patronizing and misrepresenting migrant women as weak victims without agency is violence in itself. This is insanity. Women who are victimized, murdered in honor killings, somehow by presenting them as victims, which they are, you're committing violence against them. And they go on and on to attack uh, Western civilization is inherently malicious. It speaks, it says, their cynical use of women's emancipation and the equality of women is as appalling as it is inveracious. I think it means untruthful. And then they conclude this horrible manifesto of capitulation in the name of feminism and multiculturalism. The conclusion says, Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> uh, but it is not only the fringes of the insane academic far left, of which 
We have some experience, most especially in Germany. But let me read to you from an interview with a former justice of the Constitutional Court of the Federal Republic of Germany. Der Spiegel says, asks him, uh, Hasimer, in Germany there are living many people who have grown up under very different, completely different norms and uh, feel themselves to be obligated to norms other than our Western norms. The key word is honor killing. In what form and how far should or, or may our uh, 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 criminal law take consideration of that? Here's what the Justice of the Constitutional Court says. My position, my opinion is maybe a little bit different from that of the majority. I find in such particular cases the social context and the socialization of the accused should be taken into consideration. Er lebt vermutlich nach anderen sozialen Mustern. He lives presumably according to different social patterns and consequently should not receive the same punishment as a German citizen who was raised in a different social pattern. This was raised by a particular case of a young woman who was murdered by her father and family members. So I think that these we should not capitulate to this kind of craven capitulation to murder. And in particular, the victims who are being put on this altar of so-called multiculturalism are Muslims. They are the ones being sacrificed to this ideology of self-hatred. It's the road to suicide, and it should not be followed. And people should stand up against it. The rule of law is for everyone, with no exceptions, because you live according to different social patterns. Uh, just because you have different expectations of the legal system, which is what we heard from this German justice. So ladies and gentlemen, we can advance liberty, even in very difficult places, when we work with and offer our friendship and support to those with the courage to work for civilization, free markets, free people, and free minds. I'd like to conclude by telling you about a good friend of mine whom I searched for for several years, and I knew he must exist. His name is Professor Mohammed Abul Akhra Ramispur, and he has been a lecturer in Sharia law at Kabul University. Under the Taliban, he taught that women are equal under the law. Women are not the property of their husbands. Women have equal rights, respect, right to dignity. He was threatened repeatedly and refused to capitulate. When finally the Taliban said they were going to behead him, he did leave the country with his wife and children and some other family members to Tajikistan. His sister was... Uh, murdered by the Taliban on her wedding day, as he says, in her white wedding dress. And he said, this is my country, and these savages will not drive me out. He's the sort of person who could leave, live elsewhere. He's the sort of person who should be welcomed to Denmark, or Norway, or United States. But he says, this is my country. And I will not be ruled by savages and barbarians. He's established the Afghanistan Economic and Legal Studies Organization. It's a very modest but very active group of professors and entrepreneurs and students. They do a great deal of work on the radio in a country with the maximum numbers, 28% literacy rate the highest number I've ever seen, so figure it's about 20% probably. So we do publish books in Dari and Pashto uh, in, that in Afghanistan 
I've been there a number of times. Um, this is the sort of person that we should be honored uh, to stand with because he is a carrier of the values that are universal. They're not only European or Islamic or Asian. Universal values of justice and freedom. With people like that as our allies, we can win the battle against evil. But if we reject them because of their religion or their culture, we are doomed. And I'll conclude with that note. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Most inspiring. Now we open up the floor to questions. Be aware that we are, we are uh, taping this uh, on video. We'll be podcasting this. It'll be on our website. So if you don't want to um, stand out in, in, in public, uh, you know, don't raise your hand. If you do, uh, please do, um, um, do start by telling us who you are. Anyone? Um, Fleming Rose, um, Opinion Culture Editor of Jyllands Posten. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, you spoke about uh, the success of uh, Saakashvili. You probably know, as I do, Andrei Ilarionov, who used to be the top advisor to Putin on economic affairs. And in fact, when he came in back in 2000, uh, he and German Griff also tried to reduce the number of, of uh, regulation on opening Russian businesses. And, and there was a time in the fall of 1990 and the spring of 2000 where, in fact, uh, it was fair to say that, or to think that Putin would be more liberal on economic affairs than uh, Yeltsin had been. Um, but later it turned out otherwise. I mean, why, how do you explain this? Was it the rising uh, oil prices that didn't put pressure on the Russian government, as it did after the crash in, in, uh, in August uh, 1998? That's my first question. The other has to do with, uh, with uh, the Cordoba House in, uh, in New York. Uh, I mean, what, what, what would your requirements be to um, Faisal, whom I also met uh, a, f a few years ago, because tolerance is a two-way street. And, and I remember back uh, during the cartoon crisis, uh, he spoke out and condemned uh, the cartoons, which is, which is okay with me, but he did it in a way, you know, saying you should not have done this. So, so there must be some kind of reciprocity here. And, and what is your assessment of, uh, of the imam on, on, uh, on uh, this point? Okay. I want to apologize first. If sometimes my statements seem harsher, it's partly because of having to breathe. So um, <laughs> I don't normally speak like Nikolai Ceausescu all the time. <laughs> um, with regard to Russia, I think uh, oil revenues account for a great deal of the change. And it's because when the rulers realize they have a stream of revenue independent of the citizenry, then they have very little incentive to install rule of law, accountability, or anything else. They have oil. They have money. A good example of this in Africa is the distinction between two Portuguese colonies, Angola, which is rich with oil, and Mozambique, which has nothing. I put my money on Mozambique becoming a successful country because the rulers don't have oil, they have nothing. And they realize, uh-oh, if we want to become wealthy as the rulers of the country, people have to make stuff. So they want to liberate the market and they're moving towards privatizing land. They lived under communism also. And we see the similar, whereas Angola is, in my opinion, essentially hopeless because the regime just has all the oil money they want. So I think that accounts for a substantial portion of it. Other elements also, we have seen in Russia the emergence of a regime in which the security apparatus formed the state. This is an unfortunate experience for the Russian people to be lab 
rats in an experiment, but we get to see how this works, in which the security apparatus takes over the state, uses the state to take over the media and the economy. And now uh, people are very worried in Russia. If you have something, you don't want to attract attention because someone from the Kremlin will take it from you. There was a piece in the New York Times some time ago about some Russian entrepreneurs, they're engineers, had one of the finest titanium country, companies in the world, not an old state industry. They really started it. It wasn't a dirty inside deal. And they were fabulously successful. The capitalization of the firm was extremely high and rising. They got a call from the Kremlin. We'd like to talk to you. Oh, an honor. <laughs> and then they got the offer, the one you can't refuse. Right? And uh, one of them was said, suddenly the tea did not taste as sweet. It's a very nice Russian expression. And they were told, you're going to sell for a fraction of the value and get out. And it's understood what that means. You'll have a car accident. Something is going to happen. That's why Andrei Ilarianov uh, left uh, December of 2005 rather bravely. He's now very active in Georgia, where I just saw him a few days, whatever, a week ago. Um, and he held a news conference in the Kremlin. He's also not afraid of other people. He said, in the Kremlin, I joined the government of a democratizing country on the road to prosperity and market economy and democracy. I'm now the employee of a dictatorship. But as of this moment, no longer. And he resigned. Right there in the Kremlin. And this irritated the authorities, as you can imagine. Uh, but I think oil ac accounts for most of this change. And there are other features as well. The Siloviki, the powerful guys who run Russia and have established a kleptocracy. And the Cordoba House case. There's... Uh, different ways of expressing you should not have done that. On the one hand, you could say, I wish you hadn't done something that was insulting. I think it was, I'm offended. It's another thing to say, I'm going to blow you up as a consequence. To my knowledge, he never said anything in this latter category. To say you should not have done it is a little bit different from saying, we'll get you if you do. I don't know the exact context of this particular interview. But I would even say, if he did not issue a threat of that sort, it's, it's an opinion and should not be legally actionable, subject to public criticism, but not what New Gingrich, Gingrich is trying to do, which is to confiscate his property rights in a building that they uh, created. I should mention one word, though, about this Danish cartoon issue. This was a very deliberate provocation by real bastards who wanted a fight. Those cartoons were published in Egypt. Many people do not know that. They were, and I, when I say the bastards, I'm not referring to the Danes. I'm referring to the Islamists. <laughs> it was him. I, I, no, it was him. I, I, started, I started to get the sense that I was being misinterpreted. Those cartoons were published in Egyptian newspapers. And no one blew up an Egyptian embassy. No one boycotted Egyptian products. This was a campaign. It was an occasion to, to gin up and get people angry and to do that. This was a political campaign, and this is an occasion for doing that. But the fact of the matter is, I saw those cartoons on the front pages of Egyptian newspapers. And that tells us we should understand we are dealing with an organized movement that wants to wage war. And they did this intelligently. It was not a spontaneous uprising of, of Muslims. This is not what happened. It was a very deliberate, organized campaign. And not the spontaneous expression of the Muslim mind. Otherwise, we would have seen this happening in Egypt earlier. So again, I wanted to make sure I was not misinterpreted uh, on that as I kind of could tell there was some puzzlement uh, in the audience.
But we should understand this is what we're dealing with. Deliberate provocations, not the spontaneous expression of Islam. But provocation by political extremists. Great, Tom. Um, could you expand on your last sentence of your lecture? You were talking about us being doomed if we don't um, open up to the uh, liberty, rule of law, abiding um, Muslim academics um, and thinkers. Could, could you expand on that? Because we have a discussion about that going on in Denmark. A lot, some people argue that Islam is incompatible with democracy, uh, liberal democracy that is. Right. What is your view on that? Um, I don't believe that it is incompatible in the following way. Uh, no text interprets itself. There's a kind of a general principle of interpretation. Texts are interpreted by the human mind. And actually a book I was just reading, this is the kind, I fly a lot, so I find flying very boring, so I like to read books on Mutazilism from medieval school to modern symbol, and so on. It's on the Mutazilite tradition under the Abbasid Caliphate. And they stressed that reason is the principle God has given to humankind for the interpretation of the Quran, the Hadith, and other religious texts. This tradition was largely occluded, and we now have a group of people who became dominant who said the text interprets itself, which means you will follow my interpretation. <laughs> right? But it doesn't interpret itself. So as an example, the question of apostasy, when uh, uh, Umar is punishing the tribes for refusal to pay zakat, the question is, was it a political rebellion against a ruler or an act against religion. And this is the basis for the debate. And our friends who are Muslims say this is what rulers do when people don't pay taxes. Like Europeans did also. They tended, European kings, if you said, I don't want to pay my tax, didn't say, oh, okay, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but not that therefore apostasy is punishable by death. And they point out that tribes that had rejected Islam and then returned were welcomed by the Prophet himself. So if it was punishable by death, the prophet would have ordered them killed. But he didn't. He welcomed them uh, back into the fold. So these are debates taking place. And if we say Islam is in incompatible with democracy, Islam is incompatible with freedom, what we are saying is Osama bin Laden is right. That's what that means. He's right. And when you do that, you have now deliberately given but not deliberately, uh, clearly given support and ammunition to that group of people. And that's a big mistake because it's a debate within Islam. In matters of numbers, there's more people who favor toleration than intoleration, intolerance. The problem is the intolerant people are violent and they intimidate the rest of the population. This happens in Europe. We know what happens in Europe. Decent, honest, law-abiding Muslim people are often afraid of the extremists in their midst. And they realize that the government will not protect them if they go to the government. This is a big problem. In France, my Muslim friends in France were so strongly opposed when Chirac created this Muslim council. He said, this is how we'll deal with these people. We'll give them 100 million euros is what you always do with your enemies, right? <laughs> we'll create a council and all of the liberal and tolerant Muslims said, don't do this. The extremists will take over. They're the ones who were organized. We are going to work. They're living on welfare <laughs> and paid by the taxpayers to be radicals. They will take it over. And the French government said, mm -hmm, we can, we're, fr we're French, we'll deal with this. <laughs> they set it up, by golly, that's exactly what happened. And now these people have a fortune. And the French government will not send police into those banlieues, into these ghettos. 
th those people now are afraid of the radicals who are now financed by the French state. This happened in the Netherlands also. They pay the salaries of people who come and preach murder and they are state paid. That can't be allowed. But we, all, we have to be clear. No more of that. But also, don't give credence to the Al-Qaeda types and the intolerant people by saying, yes, they're right. You people can't live with us. That's a path to disaster. My name is uh, Daniel. I, I study history. I want to go back to uh, the Russian Soviet uh, time or area. Um, if you look at the tradition regarding uh, Reagan and his legacy, uh, there's sort of a, a tradition for American professors that he um, sort of won the Cold War. At least, at least one school uh, thinks that he was a very, very important person in, in this matter. So my question to you is, if you could do it in, in a few minutes, sure. how would you explain how the, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed? Was it due to, um, to the uh, pr reforms made by Gorbachev? Was it due to internal stuff going on in, in, in um, mm. yeah? That's a fun question, and I can give an advertisement. I have a chapter in my book. <laughs> on that, which is a speech that I gave in 1991. I think it's in this, this book. Maybe it's in another book, but let me just see. <laughs> um, You'll have a chance to read it. Um, yeah, Why Socialism Collapsed in Eastern Europe, pages 289 to 296. Well worth the price of the book. <laughs> and I should point out, by the way, if you buy two copies, you can fall asleep twice as fast. So <laughs> there's some advantages. But uh, one thing to keep in mind was the challenge that Reagan issued, I do think had an impact. I don't say this because I like Reagan or don't like Reagan. I tried to explain it. The Star Wars program, which was not a big success for the US, I'm not aware of any things that shoot down missiles yet. They keep trying, and it turns out it's really hard to hit a missile with a bullet. Um, but, uh, but it presented a challenge because the Soviet leaders said, okay, let's do something like that. And they said, uh, um, we, we can't. And that led to an internal debate, and Gorbachev was very important in this. He was not some free marketeer. It was a big mistake. He's also not a horrible person, in my opinion, but not a Democrat. He had been Minister of Agriculture, and so on. The system was collapsing, and they understood. Uh, Vladimir Bukovsky has gathered thousands of documents, which he illegally copied from the archives of the Politburo during the trial under Yeltsin of the Communist Party. Yeltsin had banned it, quite correctly, in my opinion, as a criminal con and conspiracy and murder organization, like the National Socialist German Workers' Party was banned after the collapse of the Third Reich. And I think this is correct. These are criminals. Ban them. Don't punish them all per se, but they can't organize anymore. They did what some of our, what Mullah Krekar does in Norway. They said, that's not democratic. I should have the right to threaten my neighbors with murder. And the Communist Party said, but democracy, you should allow us to reorganize and re take back all of our assets, and so on, which is a huge amount of money which was later given to them again. Bukowski went in and, at the Yeltsin government's request, did research, and he brought in a handheld scanner, and he scanned these documents and then walked out with just a little briefcase and thousands of documents, which he's now putting online. I raised some money recently to help him pay for it. He's um, not in good health. And he found the minutes of the Politburo, if you read them, are amazing. General Jaruzelski from Poland says, the Polish people will continue in communism if you send us meat. He said, we want 30,000 metric tons of sausage, because there's no sausage. 
So Politburo meeting after Politburo meeting, they say, uh, Brezhnev, this happened under initially under Brezhnev. Where's the sausage? And Gorbachev, Minister of Agriculture, says, Comrade Brezhnev, all units of the party and all units of local government, all oblasts and all Soviet socialist republics are united in the effort to bring together meat. Fine, where's the meat? Well, we're working on it. Finally, they deliver some pathetic amount. I don't remember the numbers, but it's 13,000 or something tons. And Yaroselsky writes back and says, what you sent was filthy and our dogs turned up their noses at it. <laughs> this was the Soviet Empire and they could not deliver sausage to one of their clients. They were exhausted. So Gorbachev then when he comes into power deals with this problem, the Star Wars challenge. So what are we going to do? Well we need restructuring. And the first elements of restructuring were not liberation of markets. The law on unearned income, if you may recall, because there were so many black markets, they said, well, here's what we're going to do, is you have to demonstrate when you buy a high price item that you legally earned the money. Well, of course, this, <laughs> this was a catastrophe. It destroyed the, uh, the black market, which is the only thing that worked effectively. <laughs> this was an economic collapse. Then he says, Russians drink too much. Kind of obvious point. And said, well, that's the reason why we have the problem. So we cut back on vodka production. So Russians start drinking antifreeze from tanks and going blind and so on. But what he didn't know was what percentage of the state budget came from the revenue of vodka sales. It was huge. And suddenly the state budget coffers are depleted. So they move to the so-called soft budget restraint of the Soviet banks. They just print money like mad to finance things. But all prices are controlled and set by the state. So you had, if I remember, the ruble overhang. People had a lot of rubles and nothing to buy. Everything was, you know, whatever, four rubles for some useless thing. Uh, and I had 4,000 rubles. And you had all of these problems. They staggered from one thing to the next. And finally then, well, let's have openness and let's talk about it. That was kind of the end at that point, when people started saying, uh, comrade, the problem is called socialism, <laughs> when they had that discussion. That's really our problem. But they staggered from one mistake to another. It wasn't a smooth process of opening liberalization, as it has subsequently been portrayed. And I do think <coughs> that Reagan's military challenge was a stimulus internally to that process that led to collapse. Quite frankly, no one would have expected that. It was an unintended payoff, if you will. It wasn't, wasn't that Ronald Reagan and his colleagues had a secret strategy to do that, but I think that's how, how it played out in reality. Does that adequate? Well, we're better than you. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest here, so, yeah, no, I, I understand. I think it was an unintended outcome of the policy, but not a, a brilliant stroke of statecraft. Um, but I do think having spent time there and talked to a lot of people involved in the process, that's what happened. There was another element, which was a total um, demoralization of the Soviet elite. There were no communists left. They all lived in the West, the communists. There weren't any there. And I'll tell you, I will edit the comments, but comment I ma made to you. I stayed once at one of these awful conferences. I would go to them and immediately get ditch it because I couldn't stand the people there. <coughs> American and European fellow travelers. Um, and I would just go to try to find people. And I would go to parties and student groups and say, have you ever heard of Hayek or Mises or his names? Oh, I heard someone who knows someone who knows another person. <laughs> and I met some people this way. I went to the Central Economics Mathematical Institute, 
looking for one guy and I just spent three hours in the lobby approaching everyone asking if they were him. And finally I met someone who said, no, I'm not he, but I know him and I will call him. Because the, the directory of the Central Economic Mathematical Institute was from like 1964 or something. It turns out most of the people were dead. Um, but I was asked by a guy who worked at the Secretariat of the Politburo. He said, we had breakfast. He said, so, how are you liking hotel? And I said, I was at the Gosnitsi Ukraina, which is a monstrous, horrible place. The Ukraine hotel built by Stalin. There were seven of these awful buildings, really horrible, ugly, socialist, realist monuments to evil. <laughs> and, um, and this was a terrible place. And I had gone to the top floor to look around, and I learned it was the KGB floor. Because when I stepped out of the elevator, two men with no necks picked me up and threw me back in. <laughs> That's where they were listening to you in the room. They had all the suites. They were all listening to your intimate moments. And um, this guy asked, how is your hotel? And I said, well, and I was just sick of this. I said, it's dirty. It's ugly. I tried to take some Russians I had met back for a beer, which you couldn't buy any Pivo beers, impossible to find, couldn't get it. Every time you'd ask for something, they'd say, do you have beer? No, not today. Do you have wine? Maybe later. Uh, fruit juice? Sorry, not now. What do you have? So, we have vodka. Oh, <laughs> that's just what I want, is a big bottle of vodka for dinner, and even breakfast. But in any case, he says, so how do you like the hotel? I went through the thing and I said, and no Russians are allowed in the hotel. They, kicked, they wouldn't allow my Russian friends to come in for a beer. But it's full of Russians. There are every place. There are prostitutes on every floor. They follow you to the room. And he laughed and laughed. And he said, ah, ha, ha. And I'll edit the language a little bit. He said, let me tell you, if you wish to have sexual congress, with a KGB officer, go to Hotel Metropole. They're much prettier. <laughs> so that's, uh, but he, his language is a little more direct. Uh, these people didn't believe in any of this. There just weren't any communists left. And the average people who believed, who were sheltered and didn't know the world. But the elite who traveled, and by the way, this comes back to your question about the KGB. They hated the Communist Party. The KGB officers were highly trained, very educated, multilingual. Some of them even spoke Danish, which is a staggering accomplishment for foreigners. Uh, they saw the world, and they considered the Communist Party elite, even the elite, to be idiots. Some tractor factory foreman who was elevated to be his boss. They didn't like it. And they are the ones who took over and run the state because they said, we are the real elite of this country. In a certain sense, they were right. They were the educated, worldly people, and they have now taken over. But again, they weren't communists either. They're opportunists, and they like money. Tom, thank you very, very much.